Chapter Nine of the Jungle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Chapter Nine. One of the first consequences of the discovery of the Union was that Jurgis became desirous of learning English. He wanted to know what was going on at the meetings, and to be able to take part in them, and so he began to look about him and to try to pick up words. The children who were at school and learning fast would teach him a few, and a friend loaned him a little book that had some in it, and Ona would read them to him. Then Jurgis became sorry that he could not read himself, and later on in the winter, when someone told him that there was a night school that was free, he went and enrolled. After that, every evening that he got home from the yards in time, he would go to the school. He would go even if he were in time for only half an hour. They were teaching him both to read and to speak English, and they would have taught him other things if only he had had a little time. Also the Union made another great difference with him. It made him begin to pay attention to the country. It was the beginning of democracy with him. It was a little state, the Union, a miniature republic. Its affairs were every man's affairs, and every man had a real say about them. In other words, in the Union Jurgis learned to talk politics. In the place where he had come from there had not been any politics. In Russia one thought of the government as an affliction, like the lightning and the hail. "'Duck, little brother, duck!' the wise old peasants would whisper. "'Everything passes away.' And when Jurgis had first come to America he had supposed that it was the same. He had heard people say that it was a free country, but what did that mean? He found that here, precisely as in Russia, there were rich men who owned everything, and if one could not find any work was not the hunger he began to feel the same sort of hunger? When Jurgis had been working about three weeks at Brown's there had come to him one noontime a man who was employed as a night watchman, and who asked him if he would not like to take out naturalization papers and become a citizen. Jurgis did not know what that meant, but the man explained the advantages. In the first place it would not cost him anything, and it would get him half a day off, with his pay just the same. And then when election time came he would be able to vote, and there was something in that. Jurgis was naturally glad to accept, and so the night watchman said a few words to the boss, and he was excused for the rest of the day. When, later on, he wanted a holiday to get married, he could not get it, and as for a holiday with pay just the same, what power had wrought that miracle heaven only knew? However, he went with the man, who picked up several other newly landed immigrants, Poles, Lithuanians, and Slovaks, and took them all outside, where stood a great four-horse tallyho coach, with fifteen or twenty men already in it. It was a fine chance to see the sights of the city, and the party had a merry time, with plenty of beer handed up from inside. So they drove downtown and stopped before an imposing granite building, in which they interviewed an official who had the papers all ready, with only the names to be filled in. So each man in turn took an oath, of which he did not understand a word, and then was presented with a handsome ornamented document with a big red seal and the shield of the United States upon it, and was told that he had become a citizen of the Republic and the equal of the President himself. A month or two later Jurgis had another interview with this same man, who told him where to go to register, and then finally, when election day came, the packing houses posted a notice that men who desired to vote might remain away until nine that morning, and the same night watchman took Jurgis and the rest of his flock into the back room of a saloon and showed each of them where and how to mark a ballot 
and then gave each two dollars and took them to the polling place, where there was a policeman on duty, especially to see that they got through all right. Jurgis felt quite proud of this good luck, till he got home and met Jonas, who had taken the leader aside and whispered to him, offering to vote three times for four dollars, which offer had been accepted. And now in the Union Jurgis met men who explained all this mystery to him, and he learned that America differed from Russia in that its government existed under the form of a democracy. The officials who ruled it and got all the graft had to be elected first, and so there were two rival sets of grafters, known as political parties, and the one got the office who bought the most votes. Now and then the election was very close, and that was the time the poor man came in. In the stockyards this was only in national and state elections, for in local elections the Democratic Party always carried everything. The ruler of the district was therefore the Democratic boss, a little Irishman named Mike Scully. Scully held an important party office in the state, and bossed even the mayor of the city, it was said. It was his boast that he carried the stockyards in his pocket. He was an enormously rich man. He had a hand in all the big graft in the neighborhood. It was Scully, for instance, who owned that dump which Jurgis and Ona had seen the first day of their arrival. Not only did he own the dump, but he owned the brick factory as well, and first he took out the clay and made it into bricks, and then he had the city bring garbage to fill up the hole so that he could build houses to sell to the people. Then, too, he sold the bricks to the city at his own price, and the city came and got them in its wagons. And also he owned the other hole nearby, where the stagnant water was, and it was he who cut the ice and sold it, and what was more, if the men told truth, he had not had to pay any taxes for the water, and he had built the ice house out of city lumber, and had not had to pay anything for that. The newspapers had got hold of that story, and there had been a scandal, but Scully had hired somebody to confess and take all the blame, and then skip the country. It was said, too, that he had built his brick kiln in the same way, and that the workmen were on the city payroll while they did it. However, one had to press closely to get these things out of the men, for it was not their business, and Mike Scully was a good man to stand in with. A note signed by him was equal to a job any time at the packing houses, and also he employed a good many men himself, and worked them only eight hours a day, and paid them the highest wages. This gave him many friends, all of whom he had gotten together into the War Whoop League, whose clubhouse you might see just outside the yards. It was the biggest clubhouse and the biggest club in all Chicago, and they had prize fights every now and then, and cock fights, and even dog fights. The policemen in the district all belonged to the league, and instead of suppressing the fights, they sold tickets for them. The man that had taken Jurgis to be naturalized was one of these Indians, as they were called, and on election day there would be hundreds of them out, and all with big wads of money in their pockets and free drinks at every saloon in the district. That was another thing, the men said. All the saloon-keepers had to be Indians, and to put up on demand, otherwise they could not do business on Sundays, nor have any gambling at all. In the same way Scully had all the jobs in the fire department at his disposal, and all the rest of the city graft in the stockyards district. He was building a block of flats somewhere up on Ashland Avenue, and the man who was overseeing it for him was drawing pay as a city inspector of sewers. The city inspector of water pipes had been dead and buried for over a year, but somebody was still drawing his pay. The city inspector of sidewalks was a barkeeper at the War Whoop Café and maybe he could make it uncomfortable for any tradesman who did not stand in with Sully. 
Even the packers were in awe of him, so the men said. It gave them pleasure to believe this, for Scully stood as the people's man, and boasted of it boldly when election day came. The packers had wanted a bridge at Ashland Avenue, but they had not been able to get it till they had seen Scully. And it was the same with Bubbly Creek, which the city had threatened to make the packers cover over till Scully had come to their aid. Bubbly Creek is an arm of the Chicago River, and forms the southern boundary of the yards. All the drainage of the square mile of packing houses empties into it, so that it is really a great open sewer a hundred or two feet wide. One long arm of it is blind, and the filth stays there forever and a day. The grease and chemicals that are poured into it undergo all sorts of strange transformations, which are the cause of its name. It is constantly in motion, as if huge fish were feeding in it, or great leviathans disporting themselves in its depths. Bubbles of carbonic acid gas will rise to the surface and burst, and make rings two or three feet wide. Here and there the grease and filth have caked solid, and the creek looks like a bed of lava, Chickens walk about on it, feeding, and many times an unwary stranger has started to stroll across and vanished temporarily. The packers used to leave the creek that way, till every now and then the surface would catch on fire and burn furiously, and the fire department would have to come and put it out. Once, however, an ingenious stranger came and started to gather this filth in scows to make lard out of and then the packers took the cue and got an injunction to stop him, and afterward gathered it themselves. The banks of Bubbly Creek are plastered thick with hairs, and this also the packers gather and clean. And there were things even stranger than this, according to the gossip of the men. The packers had secret mains through which they stole billions of gallons of the city's water, the newspapers had been full of this scandal. Once there had even been an investigation, and an actual uncovering of the pipes, but nobody had been punished, and the thing went right on. And then there was the condemned meat industry, with its endless horrors. The people of Chicago saw the government inspectors in Packingtown, and they all took that to mean that they were protected from diseased meat. They did not understand that these hundred and sixty-three inspectors had been appointed at the request of the packers, and that they were paid by the United States government to certify that all the diseased meat was kept in the state. They had no authority beyond that. For the inspection of meat to be sold in the city and state, the whole force in Packingtown consisted of three henchmen of the local political machine rules and regulations for the inspection of livestock and their products, United States Department of Agriculture, Bureau of Animal Industries, Order No. 125. Section 1. Proprietors of slaughterhouses, canning, salting, packing, or rendering establishments engaged in the slaughtering of cattle, sheep, or swine, or the packing of any of their products, the carcasses or products of which are to become subjects of interstate or foreign commerce, shall make application to the Secretary of Agriculture for inspection of said animals and their products. Section 15. Such rejected or condemned animals shall at once be removed by the owners from the pens containing animals which have been inspected and found to be free from disease and fit for human food and shall be disposed of in accordance with the laws, ordinances, and regulations of the state and municipality in which said rejected or condemned animals are located. Section 25. A microscopic examination for trichini, made of all swine products exported to countries requiring such examination. No microscopic examination will be made of hogs slaughtered for interstate trade but this examination shall be confined to those intended for the export trade. And shortly afterward one of these, a physician, 
made the discovery that the carcasses of steers which had been condemned as tubercular by the government inspectors, and which therefore contained ptomaines, which are deadly poisons, were left upon an open platform and carted away to be sold in the city. And so he insisted that these carcasses be treated with an injection of kerosene, and was ordered to resign the same week. So indignant were the packers that they went farther, and compelled the mayor to abolish the whole Bureau of Inspection, so that since then there has not been even a pretense of any interference with the graft. There was said to be two thousand dollars a week hush money from the tubercular steers alone, and as much again from the hogs which had died of cholera on the trains, and which you might see any day being loaded into box-cars, and hauled away to a place called Globe, in Indiana, where they made a fancy grade of lard. Jurgis heard of these things little by little, in the gossip of those who were obliged to perpetrate them. It seemed as if every time you met a person from a new department you heard of new swindles and new crimes. There was, for instance, a Lithuanian who was a cattle butcher for the plant where Maria had worked, which killed meat for canning only and to hear this man describe the animals which came to his place would have been worth while for a Dante or a Zola. It seemed that they must have agencies all over the country to hunt out old and crippled and diseased cattle to be canned. There were cattle which had been fed on whiskey malt, the refuse of the breweries, and had become what the men called steerly, which means covered with boils. It was a nasty job killing these, for when you plunged your knife into them they would burst and splash foul-smelling stuff into your face. And when a man's sleeves were smeared with blood and his hands steeped in it, how was he ever to wipe his face or to clear his eyes so that he could see? It was stuff such as this that made the embalmed beef that had killed several times as many United States soldiers as all the bullets of the Spaniards. Only the army beef, besides, was not fresh canned, it was old stuff that had been lying for years in the cellars. Then one Sunday evening Jurgis sat puffing his pipe by the kitchen stove, and talking with an old fellow whom Jonas had introduced, and who worked in the canning rooms at Durham's, and so Jurgis learned a few things about the great and only Durham canned goods, which had become a national institution. They were regular alchemists at Durham's. They advertised a mushroom ketchup, and the men who made it did not know what a mushroom looked like. They advertised potted chicken, and it was like the boarding-house soup of the comic papers through which a chicken had walked with rubbers on. Perhaps they had a secret process for making chickens chemically. Who knows, said Jurgis friend. The things that went into the mixture were tripe, and the fat of pork and beef suet, and hearts of beef, and finally the waste ends of veal, when they had any. They put these up in several grades, and sold them at several prices, but the contents of the cans all came out of the same hopper. And then there was potted game, and potted grouse, potted ham, and deviled ham, deviled, as the men called it. Deviled ham was made out of the waste ends of smoked beef that were too small to be sliced by the machines, and also tripe, dyed with chemicals so that it would not show white, and trimmings of hams and corned beef, and potatoes, skins and all, and finally the hard cartilaginous gullets of beef after the tongues had been cut out. All this ingenious mixture was ground up and flavored with spices to make it taste like something. Anybody who could invent a new imitation had been sure of a fortune from old Durham, said Jurgis' informant. But it was hard to think of anything new in a place where so many sharp wits had been at work for so long, where men welcomed tuberculosis in the cattle they were feeding because it made them fatten more quickly, and where they bought up all the old rancid butter left over in the grocery stores of a continent and oxidized it by a forced air process, to take away the odor, rechurned it with skim milk, 
and sold it in bricks in the cities. Up to a year or two ago it had been the custom to kill horses in the yards, ostensibly for fertilizer, but after long agitation the newspapers had been able to make the public realize that the horses were being canned. Now it was against the law to kill horses in Packingtown, and the law was really complied with, for the present at any rate. Any day, however, one might see sharp-horned and shaggy-haired creatures running with the sheep, and yet what a job you would have to get the public to believe that a good part of what it buys for lamb and mutton is really goat's flesh. There was another interesting set of statistics that a person might have gathered in Packingtown. Those of the various afflictions of the workers. When Jurgis had first inspected the packing plants with Shedvilas, he had marveled while he listened to the tale of all the things that were made out of the carcasses of animals, and of all the lesser industries that were maintained there. Now he found that each one of these lesser industries was a separate little inferno, in its way as horrible as the killing beds, the source and fountain of them all. The workers in each of them had their own peculiar diseases and the wandering visitor might be skeptical about all the swindles, but he could not be skeptical about these, for the worker bore the evidence of them about on his own person. Generally he had only to hold out his hand. There were the men in the pickle rooms, for instance, where old Antanas had gotten his death, scarce a one of these that had not some spot of horror on his person. Let a man so much as scrape his finger pushing a truck into the pickle room, and he might have a sore that would put him out of the world. All the joints in his fingers might be eaten by the acid, one by one. Of the butchers and floorsmen, the beef boners and trimmers, and all those who used knives, you could scarcely find a person who had the use of his thumb. Time and again the base of it had been slashed, till it was a mere lump of flesh against which the men pressed the knife to hold it. The hands of these men would be crisscrossed with cuts, until you could no longer pretend to count them or to trace them. They would have no nails, they had worn them off pulling hides, their knuckles were swollen so that their fingers spread out like a fan. There were men who worked in the cooking rooms, in the midst of steam and sickening odors, by artificial light. In these rooms the germs of tuberculosis might live for two years, but the supply was renewed every hour. There were the beef-luggers, who carried two-hundred-pound quarters into the refrigerator cars, a fearful kind of work that began at four o'clock in the morning and that wore out the most powerful men in a few years. There were those who worked in the chilling rooms, and whose special disease was rheumatism. The time limit that a man could work in the chilling rooms was said to be five years. There were the wool pluckers, whose hands went to pieces even sooner than the hands of the fickle men, for the pelts of the sheep had to be painted with acid to loosen the wool, and then the pluckers had to pull out this wool with their bare hands till the acid had eaten their fingers off. There were those who made the tins for the canned meat, and their hands too were a maze of cuts and each cut represented a chance for blood poisoning. Some worked at the stamping machines, and it was very seldom that one could work along there at the pace that was set, and not give out and forget himself and have a part of his hand chopped off. There were the hoisters, as they were called, whose task it was to press the lever which lifted the dead cattle off the floor. They ran along upon a rafter, peering down through the damp and the steam, and as old Durham's architects had not built the killing room for the convenience of the hoisters, at every few feet they would have to stoop under a beam, say four feet above the one they ran on, which got them into the habit of stooping, so that in a few years they would be walking like chimpanzees. Worst of any, however, were the fertilizer men, and those who served in the cooking rooms. These people could not be shown to a visitor for the odor of a fertilizer man would scare any ordinary visitor at a hundred yards, and as for the other men 
who worked in tank rooms full of steam, and in some of which there were open vats near the level of the floor, their peculiar trouble was that they fell into the vats, and when they were fished out there was never enough of them left to be worth exhibiting. Sometimes they would be overlooked for days, till all but the bones of them had gone out to the world as Durham's pure leaf lard. End of chapter 9 Recording by Tom Weiss